all over uh, the world, there are churches meeting, there are Christians meeting in different groups, and they all have you know, different traditions, different ways of doing things, different styles. Uh, but there's, there's typically some things that tie them all together. They do some, some of the same things, like uh, typically churches will get together and sing. Different style of music, different you know, things to do, but, but they'll sing. Uh, typically pray. A lot of times read some scripture. Um, and, and do some sort of maybe a sermon or some kind of a lesson of sorts. And, and, and most of them will also do this strange little ritual called the Lord's Supper or communion or Eucharist, depending on what your tradition is. And different churches do it at different frequencies. They don't all do it every single week. We, we do it every single week. But, but it's, it's one of those things that it's a little strange looking at it from the, from the outside. And those, those of you, if, if, you're, if you're not a Christian or if you're just, you know, kind of testing the waters as far as Christianity things, uh, you, you find it maybe a little strange that, that Christians center so heavily on the death of Jesus. It's like the, the death of Jesus is something that they just, is like the center of their faith. And when they take the Lord's Supper, it's all about reflecting on and celebrating and, and, and thinking about and t- taking in the death of Jesus. And that can seem rather weird if, if unless you've just grown up with it like I have. It just seems normal. But if you're looking at it from the outside, it just seems kind of, kind of strange. Because why? Why did Jesus have to die? I mean, you think about the, 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 the cross, that whole event, it was ugly. It, it, is, it is awful. It, it's, it's, not, it's not attractive in any sort of way. You know, you know now we have the cross as jewelry, and, you know, the cross is kind of this, this symbol. It, it, it was, it was much worse than, than hanging an electric chair around your neck, okay? The, the symbol of the cross uh, in Jesus' time was just was, was awful. Because that's the way people were, were brutally killed in a way to warn everybody else, this is what will happen to you if you do this. And so why? Why do that? Why, why go through that? And, and why center your faith around this sort of event? And, and others might also say, why do you make such a big deal out of Jesus' self-sacrifice? I mean, don't people sacrifice themselves for others all the time? We hear stories of people shielding total strangers from bullets being shot by a killer and taking a bullet from somebody that they don't even know. Uh, we hear about soldiers who, who will jump on a grenade to keep their, their, other, their fellow soldiers from getting, getting injured and killed by, by that. We, there are people that are, that are giving themselves, sacrificing themselves, uh, all the time. So why make such a big deal? I mean, obviously, it's, a, it's, it's, it's yeah, we, we admire that, but why make such a big deal out of Jesus sacrificing himself? This morning, we're, we're just going to, to look at the cross, and we're going to ask the questions, why? And we're not going to get to nearly all the answers, but I'm going to look at a, at a couple of, of key things as we, as we ask the question, why? Why did Jesus have to die? If you grew up in a Christian family or went to Sunday school growing up, you probably know at least Sunday school answer of why did Jesus die on the cross? In fact, let me just do that with us just a second, okay? Um, Give us your answer, okay? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Take away our sins. Take away our sins for our sins, to forgive us of our sins, right? We we, this is typically our, our our answer growing up is Jesus died. For our sins. And that's, that's not wrong at all. That's a very right answer. In fact, it's an important answer. It's not the only answer as to why Jesus died on the cross, but it's a really, really important one, so we'll, we'll start with that, okay? Why did Jesus have to die on the cross for our sins? Why do we have to have Jesus' death to have forgiveness? Couldn't God just say, I forgive you? Couldn't God, just, couldn't God just forgive us? I mean, he's God. Why do the whole blood, cross, brutal, torture, all that stuff, when he could just say, I forgive you? Um, Tim Keller, in his book, Reason for God, gives, gives a really great illustration that, that helps with this. He said, imagine that somebody borrows your car. And they borrow your car, and as they're backing out of your driveway, they run into a uh, something in your property, like a gate or retaining wall, and they damage that gate or retaining wall as well as the car. 
and well, you got a deductible on the car because it was part insurance pays for part of that. But the wall and the gate, that there's no insurance that, that covers that. So, what are you going to do? Well, you, you, you could do a couple of things. You could demand that they pay for it, that they pay for the repairs to your car and to the gate and the, and the wall, or you can absorb the cost yourself. You can just pay for it yourself. And you can pay for it yourself by just leaving everything broken. Okay, that's a way to pay for it yourself. Or, you know, shelling out the money to fix it all. Now, you also might, you know, work out a deal where you go half season or something like that. But the point is, somebody has to pay for it. There has been damage done. There is a debt has been incurred, and somebody has to pay. Now, we understand that in, in monetary terms, but most of the time when people injure us, it's not fixed simply through money, is it? Somebody, somebody insults you. Somebody hurts your reputation. So, somebody, somebody talks about you. Uh, somebody, uh, through their actions, robs you of something that's important to you. They might rob you of a, of a job. They might rob you of a relationship. They might rob you of the life of a family member even. People take away things from us that we value. They might rob you of a pleasure. They've taken something. They've somehow taken something that was yours. They've damaged you. And there is something inside of me and something inside of you that says somebody has to pay for it. Someone has to pay. And when there has been damage done to us, we have a couple of options. Okay? One of our options is we can try to make the other person pay for the way that they've hurt us. And we can do that in a lot of different ways, right? Um, we can do it by simply hurting them the same way that they hurt us. We can actually physically hurt them. That's one way to try to make them pay. Or we can confront them and we can just tear them apart with hurtful words. Or we can go and talk to other people about them and get them or hurt their reputation, get them to turn against that person. Or we can just look at them disdainfully. We can give them that hateful look. We can give them that evil eye. They can know that they are, it's just that, that hatred that comes out. Or we can just give them the silent treatment, right? Now, we, we don't think of giving people a silent treatment as making them pay, but that's what we're doing, right? We are trying to, in some way, make them pay for what they have done to us. And that is our typical and natural response in some way. But there are problems with it. I mean, for one thing, they could return the hurt we're trying to give back to them with more hurt. You know, we have that revenge. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you, now you hurt me, and you get in this cycle, and the, and the pain and the hurt simply grows, simply deepens, gets worse. Even if they don't respond with revenge, there's something that happens to you, something that happens to me when we, when we try to make the other person pay. You become harder, more calloused. You become more self-absorbed. Something Something shrivels up, and hardens inside of you when you're trying to make that other person pay for what they've done. So when we take that route, we are not just making them pay. We're not just hurting them back. We're hurting ourselves. When you respond to evil with evil, the evil just grows. And so that response that we have to make them pay, um, it seems satisfying somewhat, but it ends up hurting us more than we were hurt to begin with. So, so what, what else could we do besides doing that? Well, we could absorb the damage, the cost of the damage, ourselves. We could take on that hurt, and we can, we can pay for it ourselves. Now, what that is called is forgiveness. Forgiveness is saying, you hurt me, you damaged me, but I am not going to retaliate. I am not going to tear you apart, even in my mind. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and tear you apart in my mind. I'm not going to work behind the scenes. I'm not going to undermine you. I'm not going to try to hurt your reputation. I'm not going to give you the evil eye. I'm not going to give you the silent treatment. I am not going to require any payment on your part for the damage that you've done me. Now that 
is hard. And that hurts. It is, it is, it hurts. It is painful to simply take the damage that has been done to me and then to absorb the cost of paying for it, to pay for it myself. That it, it, it hurts. It's almost, it's almost like a death in some ways. It's like here is something that is mine. Here is something I deserve. I deserve payment. This, this, I deserve to be, to be paid back because I have been damaged. And now I am going to go through the hurt, the pain, of paying for it myself so that you don't have to. Where I require no payment from you. That's called forgiveness. The thing about forgiveness is, is it costs something. It costs us. We get the double hurt of being damaged by somebody and by absorbing the cost of that damage ourselves. And it can be excruciating. And that's why it's so hard for us to do it. It's so much easier to stew, to be mad, to, to try to get them back, to lash out at them, to try to freeze them out, to do, you know, to treat them some ways to. to push that damage back on them to make them pay in some way. It's so much easier. And yet, when we do forgive, when we do make that decision to not require payment from them, and we make that decision and we make that decision, it is difficult at the outset, but what it does ultimately is it sets us free. The bitterness gradually goes away. The anger subsides gradually, so it takes a while. Our, our emotions can't adjust that quickly, but it, it takes a while. But when we choose to forgive, we end up living an easier, freer life. Like so many things in life, what is most difficult to do at the outset ends up being what's easier in the long run. What's most difficult to do at the outset is what gives us freedom in the long run. That's, that's forgiveness. And the point I'm trying to make is that forgiveness is costly. You cannot just forgive. You have to absorb the cost yourself, and so it costs a lot. So couldn't God just forgive us? There is no such thing as just forgiveness. It involves paying a cost. Tim Keller says this way. He says, on the cross, we see God doing visibly and cosmically what every human being must do to forgive someone, though on an infinitely greater scale. So Jesus' suffering and sacrificing on the cross is nothing less than a visible, tangible picture of God going through the necessary pain, suffering, and sacrifice that forgiveness requires. God is a God of justice. He must punish injustice. He must punish sin. And he is also a God who loves us deeply and wants to forgive us. So he has chosen to absorb the cost of our sin against him, himself so that we might be in an intimate relationship with him. Of course, there, there's, there's so much more going on on the cross than just Jesus' physical suffering, okay? When Jesus went to the cross, he took on all the sins of us all. So, so much, we, we really can't imagine what God the Father and God the Son were experiencing when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We really can't imagine what was, what was going on, the, the kind of pain that was being endured and gone through in that experience. But we do get a glimpse of it. There is enough of that physical that we can see where we can see the suffering that God took on for us. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, John says this. He says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus' death on the cross was necessary because forgiveness is costly. But like we mentioned before, Jesus' death on the cross isn't just about 
forgiveness. That's as important as that is. And as important as that is for us to have a relationship with God, it's not simply about that. Another thing about the cross is that it is the defining characteristic of the kingdom of God that Jesus began. Now that, that's maybe hard to, to absorb. Let me try to explain. A thousand years before Jesus came to earth, we had King David and his son, King Solomon, uh, over the, the, the kingdom of Israel. And for a thousand years from, from their time until Jesus, and especially the last 600 years leading up to Jesus, the Israelites, the Jews, were expecting a king. They were looking for a king, a king like David, but even more so, a king who would come and drive out the enemies who were pressing them because the Israelites for that last six, six seven hundred years were always ruled by a foreign power, would drive out the, the uh, enemy people that, that, that oppressed them, would set up a kingdom, and would rule the world forever. They were looking for that. The, the Jews hung on to the, the statements of prophets like this one from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, he says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The Israelites looked at prophecies like this, and they longed for the day when the king would come. So naturally, when Jesus came onto the scene and announced, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. They were excited. And here Jesus is doing these miracles. He's doing these profound teachings. And so many people are like, hey, maybe he's the king. Maybe he's the guy. And so they were, uh, they were excited about it. And at the time, Jesus, he never denied being king, okay? Jesus never, never said, no, no, guys, I'm, I'm not the king. He never denied that. But he really danced around it quite a bit. He didn't address it directly because they didn't understand the kind of king he was going to be. This was, this was going to be very different. In fact, when the people would get super excited and want to make him king, even times like this would happen. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus had to hide, okay? It's like, these people, they're about to, to just sit up and try to make me king. i got to get out of here until things calm down so that we can go on, because that's simply not the king that I'm going to be. So you can imagine how disappointed the people would have been when Jesus just wasn't assuming this role of being king. He, he called himself son of man. That was one of the Old Testament you know, uh, uh, ways of phrasing the Messiah, the king that was going to come. So he, he, he referred to himself kind of like king, but, but he, wouldn't, he wouldn't take the throne. People became disillusioned. It, that may have been the reason Judas betrayed him. Judas very well may have become very upset and dis disillusioned with Jesus because he simply wasn't becoming the king that he expected. Certainly the crowd that ended up turning on Jesus, that was involved in that as well. Jesus had tried to prepare his followers or his closest followers for this. You know, he had, he had, he had said to his apostles, he said, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be killed. I'm going to be killed. Uh, I'm going to lay down my life for the world. But they didn't get it. They, they couldn't. It just didn't fit into their paradigm of what Jesus was going to be. Instead, Jesus willingly allowed himself to be killed. When he had finally got the religious leaders mad enough at him, and they arrested him, and they questioned him, he didn't, he didn't try to get out of it. He didn't talk his way out. He said just enough to ensure that they would accuse him of blasphemy, and that they would crucify him. Why? Why that way? Because his death is the way that he became king. And his death is the way of the followers of Jesus. This is the way that Jesus, Jesus became our Savior and our King, and this is the way his followers are to pattern their lives. Paul, the Apostle Paul, put it this way. He said to the Christians in Philippi, he said, in your relationships with one another, 
have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, this is an important therefore, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The kingdom of God was born through Jesus' sacrificial death. This is the way he started the kingdom. And this is the way that Christians are to model their lives. We become leaders by, become, by becoming servants. We, be, we become great by becoming less. We win when it seems like to the world that we're simply losing. We live life to the fullest when we willingly die to ourselves. This is the irony of the entire Christian experience is that life doesn't simply follow birth. Real life follows death. Jesus laying down his life was the way in which he became the king over creation. And he calls his people to lay down their lives and follow him. Have you ever thought it was weird that Jesus said, Whoever wants to come after me must take up his cross and follow me. He says, guys, this is the pattern. This is the way you to live. You lay down your life for others, and you, in the process, find life. You gain your life by losing it. You try to keep your life. It vanishes. But you let your life go, and you find it. It's the paradox. It's the irony. It's the crazy way of thinking that God has. And God says, you want to follow me? Lay down your life. Jesus, God made flesh. He died for you. He died for me. He did it for a lot of reasons, but here's two. That forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness requires payment. And loving self-sacrifice is the way of life in God's kingdom. God is filled with joy, peace, and love. He is the very definition of life itself. Yet he is not that way because he insulated himself from pain and suffering and trial. No, God enters into our pain. He enters into our suffering. He lays himself down for us so that we might have life with him. So this morning, just know that Jesus died for you. And he became king through his suffering, through his death so that you and I might have life. And as we follow that pattern of rather than becoming self-absorbed, of having to pay back the wrongs that are done to us, of being all, everything about ourselves and our selfish nature, of giving that up, of laying that down every morning as we get up, that's how we discover life in Him. Let's pray. Dear Father, I feel so inadequate in talking about the cross because I know there's, there's so much more to it. It's the story is so rich and so deep of what you have done through, uh, for us through Jesus. But God, I pray just in a little bit, in a small way, that you begin to open our eyes to your way of life to your costly forgiveness of us so that we could live in intimate relationship with you. God, thank you so much.
that instead of punishing us for our sins, instead of handing out the punishment that we deserve, you chose to bear the punishment yourself and lay your life down for us. Thank you. Even though we don't understand it, even though there's no way we can fathom the depth of it, we say, we say thank you. And God, help us to lay our lives down so that we can live. Help us to face the death of our self-absorbed, selfish-centered self so that we can have life as you created it. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. If you, uh, not that any of us have all the answers, but if, but if, but if you're struggling with questions and you have, have, have questions about things that are happening, please, please come and talk. Have, have conversations with, we, we love to talk about things even that are deep, deep and over our heads. Uh, if there's the questions you have, I'd love to, love to talk to you about it. Um, if, if you would, if you would like to become a Christian, if you've never become a follower of Jesus, and, and you, would, you would like to do that, you're, that your, your faith is, is to the point where you say, you know what? I believe. I believe. I, I, want, I want to live his life. I want to accept what he has done for me and live the life that he has for me. Uh, please please let, let one of us know. We can, we can baptize you in a cross. Baptism is just, it's this picture of death and resurrection. That Jesus, we, we die to ourselves and are buried in that water and we come out, spiritually speaking, a resurrected life, a child of God, a new person, not because of anything we've done, but because of what he's done for us. That's just a symbol God has given us to help us see we have a new life. And we'd love to do that. I uh, hope you have a wonderful week. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, be careful. A lot of you be traveling. I know some of you are already traveling. And I just hope you have a, a wonderful, thankful time this week. You're dismissed.